Welcome to all of you who are now continuing with part eight in a story from Wu. We begin at Kimayo's community. In the Valley of Glimmering Light, Kimayo decided to follow the idea in her morning meditation. So she asked Hummingbird if she could take Crow Wolf that morning and bring him to the cave where Sunwalker had shown her the stones that glimmered in the sunlight. Sunwalker called them crystals and showed Kimayo how they gave off a pulsing energy when you held them. Crow Wolf cooed and smiled when Kimayo placed him gently on a bed of crystals with two blankets underneath to protect him from any of the sharp edges. The morning meditation also brought forth the image of the sacred feathers. So Kimayo brought the feathers as well. As she put her hand on Crow Wolf's heart, the thought came to place the sacred feathers on Crow Wolf. Carefully, Kimayo placed the feathers on the baby so that the tips pointed toward his head. A powerful energy began to surge from the baby and the feathers. Kimayo felt chills prickling her skin. She closed her eyes and sensed images of ancient people communicating with birds and animals. Then she saw Crow Wolf going on a long journey with a crow and a wolf leading him. This child is very powerful, she thought, as she carried him back to his mother. As Crow Wolf grew older, Kimayo noticed how birds and animals, spiders, snakes, and all sorts of creatures were drawn to him. She also noticed that whenever the sacred feathers were used in a ceremony, the young boy turned the palms of his hands upward in their direction. She wondered if he was feeling their energy or adding his own energy to the feathers. Meanwhile, we return to Feather Trumpet. Giant feathers swooped down from the sky and attacked Feather Trumpet in his dreams. He shook himself awake in a cold sweat and held his hand on his forehead. Why do these headaches and bad dreams keep happening, he wondered. Raven watched out of the corner of her eye with her sleeping back almost covering her face. The leaves she had slipped into Trumpet's drink last night were helping his behavior become more erratic. Each day, she watched how the guards became more and more wary of him. At just the right moment, she would win the guards over and leave Feather Trumpet by himself in the jungle. She had not told anyone that she had seen smoke the day before, in the distance to the north. This gave her a new direction to head, but she wanted to get rid of Trumpet before they reached the place where she saw the smoke. She estimated that it was probably a two days journey away. With the morning breakfast, Raven added more of the finely grounded leaves into Trumpet's meal. She had discovered these leaves near their old village, when tasting just a tiny piece of one, she realized that they caused hallucinations in the mind. She wondered what eating a great amount of them would do. So she dried the leaves and carefully marked them in her medicine bag with an unusual knot. As Feathered Trumpet finished his meal, he groaned and then swung his fists at one of the guard with no apparent reason. Then, when Trumpet took out his large knife, and was about to slay the guard, the guard's friend tripped him and tied his hands. He's unconscious. What do we do now? The guard asked, and everyone looked at Raven. Give him this to calm him, she said, as she handed one of the guards a potion that she knew would put Trumpet to sleep for a long time. She wanted to make sure that Trumpet did not hear how she was going to convince the guards to follow her. Within minutes, Feather Trumpet was snoring, and Raven began her persuasion. 
Ever since that head injury, she began, he has been unpredictable. I am not surprised he tried to attack one of his own men. He's been having strange dreams at night and then was still reacting to them when awake. I think his mind is going. We can leave him here with someone to watch him, and I will resume the trip. I saw some smoke about a two days journey away, so it won't be long before we can get the feathers and return home. No one wanted to stay with Feather Trumpet, which did not surprise Raven. But she made it their decision to leave him alone. In this way, she could say that she was not responsible for what happened to him. If she could get the men to leave right now, she thought, that would give her at least a half a day's journey before Feathered Trumpet awoke. Before Raven spoke her thoughts about leaving, one of the guards remarked, The sooner we get those feathers, the sooner we get to return home. So let's get going toward the smoke you saw, Raven. Great, she thought. My plan is working. Raven and the guards headed north, leaving Feathered Trumpet slumped against a tree with his hands tied in front of him and his large knife in his lap. It was closer to a three-day journey before Raven's group arrived at the place where she saw the smoke. They crouched behind some bushes and watched a group of people near a large fire. An elderly woman was holding a child in her arms, while another woman was feeding the child some liquid. Raven sensed that the child was sick and wondered where all the men were. There were mostly women and children in this group, with only two young men that she could see. This did not look like the group of the people who had tied her up in the ravine. But the woman holding the child looked familiar. Hmm, was this someone from the mainland of Mu, she wondered. Raven told the men to stay in their hiding place, and since she was a woman, this group would probably not feel threatened by her. She would find out where the men were. Slowly and peacefully, Raven approached the group with her palms up, showing that she was not carrying a weapon. The woman holding the child gasped in surprise when she recognized the healer from Mu, who had healed her leg from a poisonous snake bite. Praise be to the Creator, cried the old woman as she moved toward Raven. You have come to heal my son as you healed my leg long ago. Help us, please, before we all die from the sickness of the bad water. While Raven examined the child's tongue, eyes, and pulse, the old woman explained how their men drank bad water on their last hunting trip. One man managed to return home but whatever had killed the other men soon killed him and then spread to the other members of the community. Raven also learned that these people left Feather Trumpet's village as soon as he declared himself leader. They saw immediately how he was a selfish and arrogant leader, and they decided to risk the jungle before surrendering to his ruthlessness. Raven finally realized that this was not the group who took the sacred feathers. She asked them if they met or had seen other groups in their journey. The old woman told her that there was a group to the south, some people to the northeast, and still others to the southeast. Raven felt exhausted just thinking of all the traveling she would have to do to check all those communities. But then the child she had given the herbs to suddenly opened his eyes and before she knew what was happening, the people were preparing a feast for her and asking her to stay as their medicine woman. Raven felt it was safe now to tell these people that she was traveling with a group of men. She decided to tell them that they were on a sacred journey. The community of mostly women were excited to invite Raven's men to the feast. Perhaps we can rest here for a while, Raven thought. The men will renew their spirits with all this attention from these eager women. So she continued ministering herbs to the sick ones and enjoying the feast and merriment that evening. 
Little did she know that the guards would become attached to this place and refuse to leave for many cycles of the season. Back to Feather Trumpet. When Feather Trumpet opened his eyes, everything around him seemed blurry. At first he thought he was back in his old village, but then his mind slowly remembered how he was on a journey to recover the sacred feathers. Guards, he yelled out, as his weak legs buckled when he tried to stand up. A clinking noise of something falling made him realize that his hands were tied in front of him and that he just dropped his large knife. What? he scoffed in disbelief. Who would tie me up like this? Vague memories of swinging at a guard and then being tripped came back to him. They would not leave me here like this unless, unless Raven talked them into it. I should have known to watch her more carefully. It did not take long for Feather Trumpet to move the twine around his wrist back and forth against his large knife until he was free. But which way did they go? He was not sure. Since they had been heading east most of the time, he decided to follow the natural break in the undergrowth, which was going slightly southeast. Wait until I find her, he grumbled over and over while hacking the undergrowth out of his way. Wait until I find her. After five days of eating and drinking whatever he could, Feather Trumpet was beginning to feel that he was lost. He squatted down by a small stream to cup up some water with his hands and gather his thoughts. Suddenly, Splashing and yelling sounds came from down the stream. Trumpet jumped back quickly so he could observe what was happening without being seen. Two young boys were fighting furiously. One yelled, If you hadn't dropped that log at the ravine, we could have gotten back across. Now we're trapped on this side and can't get home. And the other said, But the log cracked and, and that giant beast was after us. It was about to come across the log and get us. The two kept hitting and punching and splashing until they both were so exhausted that they sat down in the water, panting for breath. As Feather Trumpet carefully approached them, he searched the area around where they had entered the stream. The pair of footprints assured him that these two boys were alone. Their language was very much like his. If he could help them find their way home, maybe he would get rewarded for his efforts, he decided. Perhaps I can help you too, began Feather Trumpet as he approached the boys. Startled, the boys began scrambling to their feet to run away from this large, unknown man with unkempt hair and a filthy body. But Trumpet yelled out quickly, Better not go that way. I saw the giant beast over there. The boys froze immediately, looked at each other, and then at the strange man, and then at each other again. The one that was brownish-yellow with black spots shouted the shorter boy. Yes, Trumpet smiled. He was ferocious. He sounded the last word with a roaring manner. Who are you? inquired the taller boy, wanting more information before he chose to trust this stranger over another encounter with the beast. I am... Feather Trumpet stalled a minute while he was trying to make up a believable tale. I am Brave One, the one who travels the jungles to make sure children are not eaten by beasts. When the boys gave a skeptical glance, Trump altered his story a bit. I am on a vision quest, and I'm not supposed to tell anyone until I find the stolen sacred object. But seeing the beast so close to you boys, I could not live knowing that I had allowed it to eat you. That got the boys' attention. The beast was close by. They huddled closer together. Trumpet saw that this approach was working better. Do either of you know how to swing a large knife like this? He held up his large knife so that the sun reflected on it and made it seem more enormous. 
I do, stuttered the taller boy, trying to be brave. Then here, Trumpet said, handing him the large knife. You guard for us a moment while I wash my face and body to become more presentable for your people. Do you live far away, he added, while splashing his face. No, responded the boy, holding the knife and surveying the area for danger. Once we get back to the ravine, we know our way home. It's not far. But to be safe, you will need me and my sacred knife to protect you, boasted Trumpet. He decided that his sacred journey also needed a sacred knife to embellish the story. The boys looked at each other. It did not take long for them to decide that traveling home with his stranger would be safer than traveling home alone. So when Sacred Trumpet was washed and presentable, he had the boys show him where the ravine was. The crevice in the earth was wider and deeper than Trumpet had imagined. He looked in both directions to see if they could cross at a better place. The canyon looked as though it went as far as the eyes could see, and the drop was too steep to climb. The only way across would be to find or build something long enough to walk across. You said there would be a log long enough to get across here, Trumpet asked in disbelief. Yes, it had fallen from the other side and just reached this side. We were both frightened to run across it, but the beast was right behind us, explained the taller boy. And the log cracked when I came after him, added the other boy. Then, when I lifted it to shake it so the beast could not come across, the log broke and fell down to the bottom. They all looked over the edge, but could not see any trace of the log. I'm going to have to build something safe to cross this large crevice, Feather Trumpet decided, and began instructing the boys what to gather. It took almost two days to cut and gather the twigs and logs and everything to make a safe bridge. All three of them were needed to carefully lift and then angle the structure so it would rest safely on the other side. Trumpet carefully tested it before he allowed the boys to cross it. By the time the boys and their new friend arrived home, they had all sorts of stories to tell their people about how brave and resourceful this man was. The name Brave One stuck, and Trumpet liked that better than Feathered Trumpet. It felt good to be honored and admired by people again. Maybe he should stay here for a while. Their leader was very old, so perhaps they would need a new leader very soon, he reasoned. Meanwhile, he was asked to train the boys in hunting and building skills. These were a very simple people, and thus he appeared to be someone with great ability in their eyes. Back to Kimayo's community. When twelve cycles of the season had passed, Crow Wolf was as skilled a hunter as men twice his age. He often hunted alone because he liked to commune with the animal before he met it in the wild. And then he made sure to thank it for presenting itself as food for the people. He carefully used every aspect of the animal for tools, weapons, carrying containers, clothes, gifts, so nothing was wasted. Crow Wolf's mother, Hummingbird, had taught him to honor every part of Mother Earth as sacred. Hummingbird told him, treat everyone and everything with kindness. Move through the day with joy and gratitude for all the Creator has provided. All the beauty for your eyes to see all the sounds for your ears to hear, all the taste for your mouth to enjoy. Listen to everything as though the Creator is speaking to you through it. Allow humility to keep your heart open. Pride will shut the door to knowing the truth. Hummingbird watched her son sharpen his tools. He often sat somewhere near the sacred feathers. She wondered if he communed with them or just like being near their energy. A hawk circling above caught her attention 
as she began hiking toward the place where she usually meditated in the morning. After becoming still, with her eyes closed, she focused on a point in the center of her forehead. Peace filled her and continued until the hawk's cry caused her to open her eyes. The hawk flying overhead dropped something like a stick which plopped on the ground behind a bush nearby. That's unusual, thought Hummingbird. Curiosity caused her to go and look to see what was dropped. There was a stick on the ground behind the bush but there was also four hawk feathers. They have the same shape and size as the sacred feathers, she mused. Since Crow Wolf is so fond of the sacred feathers, I think I will make him a holder and carrying case for these hawk feathers. I will design it just like the one that holds the sacred feathers. Then he will have his own sacred feathers, she smiled. When Hummingbird finished her gift and presented it to Crow Wolf, his eyes sparkled with delight. Mother, he gasped, I just had a dream last night in which a hawk presented me with something. But I could not see what it was. I will show these to my friend Hawk and ask him if he will help me learn how to soar above to see the broader picture the way he does. These feathers are just for you, Crow Wolf, Hummingbird responded. You are a very generous person, so I do not want you to give them away. It's very important that you keep them. As she said the last sentence, she knew somehow that it was true, but did not know why. Crow Wolf showed the new hawk feathers to his friends and family and made sure to carry them with him wherever he went. Hawk gladly showed Crow Wolf the skill of soaring above to see the broader picture. Crow Wolf thanked him by giving Hawk one of the crow feathers with a shell sewn on it that his mother had made for him. Hawk had always admired the crow feathers that both Wolf and Turtle had. He remembered how Wolf remarked how his skin prickled with energy when Hummingbird handed the crow feathers to him. Hawk felt the same prickly sensation when Crow Wolf handed the crow feather to him. I shall honor this feather and shell from Moo. May you and Moonbeam be blessed with the child you want, Crow Wolf said as his eyes lowered to the ground and he began walking away. Then he turned and added, You may, you may want Moonbeam to tie the crow feather in her hair. Hawk's mouth dropped open. He had just been thinking about doing that. And how did Crow Wolf know that he and Moonbeam had been wanting a child? Hummingbird must have told him, he decided, as he went to find Moonbeam to share the crow feather and blessing with her. Back to Raven. At first, Raven was upset when the guards refused to leave this new community. They had never been treated with such kindness and respect before. Raven could appreciate that. If she were honest with herself, she also liked being honored as the people's medicine woman. She had no feathered trumpet to contend with and thus blossomed as a thoughtful and gifted healer. The people looked to her for guidance and leadership. She remembered the day the elderly woman, Gentle Breeze, brought her the most beautiful grouping of feathers she had ever seen. My grandmother was a medicine woman and passed these on to me, said Gentle Breeze, hoping that I would continue in her path. But I have not been blessed with a healing touch. So I cannot think of a better way to continue my grandmother's energy and good work than to pass the feathers on to you, Raven. You have helped so many of us, and we do not know how to thank you. My daughter and many other women are over-grieving their dead husbands because you brought us these fine and noble men. We now have many new ones on the way, so our community will continue to grow. Thank you. May these feathers bless you. Raven was deeply touched by the gift, 
the colorful feathers had a certain peace about them. However, her mind was not satisfied completely because they were not the sacred feathers which had many lifetimes of prayers added to them and a power she had never experienced before. Was the power from the feathers or the ones using them? She wondered again. When Feather Trumpet had the feathers for a brief time, she did not remember the same energy coming from them as when Sacred One held the feathers in front of her. She looked again at the colorful feathers Gentle Breeze had given her. The thought came to hold them up toward the sun with both arms raised. As she did this, the wind lifted her cape, spreading it wide. Look, someone shouted, as they saw Raven holding the feathers in the sunlight with her wind-swept cape, making it appear as though she was superhuman. The crowd began to form and chant some sacred tones, which were meaningful to these people. Raven felt as though she had left her body. The tones of the chant lifted her spirit, so she felt as though she were floating. Stay with our people, we need you, cried Gentle Breeze. Raven asked the people to get into a circle, and she blessed each of them with the colorful feathers. What a glorious day that was, she remembered, she felt so fulfilled. Why is it not enough? She kept asking herself. Why do I still think I need to have those sacred feathers? Many cycles of the seasons had passed, and Raven had remained with these good people. She was grateful to be able to share her abilities in a useful way. But the sacred feathers were always in the back of her mind. So we conclude part eight. Thank you for all of you who are still watching. Hope you're enjoying it. I send you my love and blessings. Until next time, namaste.